Station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is Station. I am ready for the event. NBC News, this is Mission Control Houston. NBC Please call Station, call Station for a voice check. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Al Roker with NBC News. How do you hear me? Mr. Roker, Brother Roker, Al, it is great to hear your voice. I have you loud and clear. How me? Uh, oh, this is terrific. Well, I, I can't wait to, to do this. First of all, very excited to find out uh, that we are our uh, fraternity brothers. Yes, I feel the same way. <laughs> Well, from, from one sigma to another, uh, and for those of us who are more firmly planted on Earth, what is it like uh, being at the International Space Station, and, and how did it differ from what you thought it would be? It's so many things. That's a big question. It, it is an amazing place to be. It's, it is an outreach facility, a manufacturing facility, laboratory but I, I try to emphasize the fact that it's also our home. I mean, this is where we live, and the seven of us up here are like a family. It is amazing what this place can do. And, and having gone on my first spacewalk yesterday and seeing it from the outside up close, it continues to amaze me what we have in, in this amazing International Space Station. And, and how it differed from what I expected, it's just so perplexing to be in microgravity. There are things that you think will be difficult and they're not, but then the things that you think may not be can be challenging. And so uh, it, it's, it's really important to go slow. And, and we have a saying, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And I found that to be true in, in everything that we do up here. And so it's what I guess is surprising me the most is how challenging certain things can be because it takes so much attention while you're up here. You mentioned your first spacewalk. What was that like? Well, it, it was just yesterday, and so I have to be honest, I'm still processing it. It was amazing. The, the first moment going out of the hatch and seeing the Earth 260 or so miles beneath us was, uh, was it woke me up, let's say. And, and you know, I, I, had, I had to focus on every task, and so I, I tried to just keep the very next thing that I had to do in mind because it was such a big event, a big moment that it was easy to get lost and overwhelmed by that. And so I just focused on the very next step and, and that seemed to, to get, get us through safely. And so um, it, was, it was amazing though. There was a time where we had some time to talk and to think about our next move when things didn't go as we had planned. And so I had some time to take a deep breath and, and consciously look around and take in the scenery and uh, Watching the size and set from outside the space station is truly phenomenal. It was an amazing view. I can only imagine. And, and here you are, you're, you're up there at the ISS. And, and being up there is, is uh, unbelievable in itself. But you're making a, a big milestone as the first African-American uh, crew member on an extended uh, mission on the International Space Station. Is, is that lost on you? It is absolutely not lost on me. I think it's important that America's space program represent the best of America. And so for little kids to, to be able to see someone that looks like them, that is super important to me. But, but I also think the, the overriding thing for me is that this isn't about me. There is a long legacy of folks that leads up to now, and that legacy is so important to me, from the first black astronaut, Guy Bluford, the first black female astronaut, Dr. Mae Jemison, and to, to my current mentor, Stephanie Wilson, and the current colleagues I have in the office, Jeanette Epps and, and Jessica Watkins. Uh, but, but truth be told, the entire astronaut office, from the very beginning, the, the original seven astronauts that were military test pilots, male, white, even those folks did their best to see that this legacy that we call human spaceflight would end up where it is today. And so all of the outside forces that may have prevented this from happening until now, well, the folks inside our office were all responsible for us getting to this point. And so again, it's not about me. I, the person who assigned me to this mission is, is Pat Forrester, our former chief, and, uh, and he's very much responsible for this as well. And, and, and ultimately, the fact that this is the first means it's the beginning of a time where little kids are going to just know that people of all colors, 
have gone to the space station and contributed. And so the fact that this is the beginning of that just becoming normal, that is the most important aspect. And, and the mission, obviously, important. What is your, what is your six-month mission? Well, it's to to take care of this space station. There's lots of maintenance that we do every week, and we also conduct hundreds of different science experiments. There are experiments that are going on outside of the space station all the time. We have several different experiments going on inside of the space station in racks in different little facilities like our our life sciences glove box which i'm standing right next to that we use for for biological and life sciences but we also have experiments that are are run on us and so i i am doing a food physiology experiment for example and so there are dozens uh, of, of experiments that each of us are doing simultaneously. We have spacewalks to continue to upgrade and, and maintain the capabilities of the space station. We continue to improve it and, and optimize it for, for future missions. Uh, and then there is also uh, the outreach portion, being able to talk to, to our fellow countrymen and to let them know the, the good news of what we're doing up here in space. Uh, is a part of it. And, and our, our mission had a very unique aspect is we flew to the space station in a, a spacecraft built by SpaceX, a, a commercial entity that we partner with, and they were able to send up the first uh, commercial vehicle to, to bring cargo to the space station, and now they have a vehicle that also brings crews to the space station. And so this is a very important time. Uh, Bob and Doug, our colleagues, flew the test mission, and then that opened the door for us to fly a full four-person crew up in our Crew Dragon, which we have nicknamed Resilience uh, because of the amazing resilience that we've seen uh, as we've been training for this mission on board the International Space Station. Yeah, Victor, I, I was wondering, did, did you always want to be an astronaut? Um, I have to, I got I to gotta answer in two parts. That dream for me was two parts. When I was a kid, I saw a shuttle launch on television, and I thought to myself, I would love to drive that. I, I, I wanted to be a fireman, a policeman like my father, a, a stunt car driver, a race car driver. So just to show you where my head was at. And seeing a space shuttle launch on TV, I thought to myself, oh, I'd love to drive that too. I didn't know any pilots or any engineers. Uh, and so I didn't really have a frame of reference for what it meant to get there, but, but, I, but it did become a dream. But it wasn't until I was older and I was in the Navy and I was in test pilot school and I went to a conference and had the pleasure of listening to Pam Melroy, one of the few female shuttle commanders that we've had. And she was talking about her mission and the amazing techno technological and operational accomplishments, but it was the way she talked about her crew. And, and being a college athlete, I knew how important it was to have that camaraderie and that, that uh, being a part of a small, high-performing team. And I just thought, I, I want to throw my hat in the ring, and the worst they can do is tell me no, and I'll still be flying jets in the Navy, so let's see how it goes. And that was the beginning of the professional dream, the adult dream. You know, our series is called Change Makers in honor of Black History Month. How do you hope you being part of this mission inspires other young people of color and other folks uh, who want to literally reach for the stars? Well, you said it. I hope this mission inspires folks to reach for the stars and to make plans to get there. I, I, I think it's important for folks to be able to, to dream in full living color, to be able to see folks that look like themselves. But you know what? I, I have to be honest and tell you a story. One of my favorite moments in, in the seven years, almost eight years I've been at NASA, is one of my colleagues, uh, one of my classmates, Jessica Meir, her nephew called me Captain America. And I tell you, it's not just about young black kids or young brown kids, it's all kids. And, and that's what I've contributed and dedicated my life to is my children and making sure the next generation has the tools, not just the motivation, but they have the tools and the skills, the training and education to reach out and grab those dreams, not just to dream them up, but to make plans to achieve them. And so I hope this just continues to put gas in the tank and fuel that passion. Uh, and, and like you said, most important, if they can see themselves doing it, that's the beginning of them going out and accomplishing those dreams. Uh, I notice your call sign is uh, Ike, which stands for I Know Everything. Uh, <laughs> how'd that come about? 
Okay, okay you do your research, I see. Uh, well, uh, the short version of the story is, you know, you show up to a squadron in the Navy, and we have this tradition. A lot of the nicknames will start with your name, plays off of your name. My first call sign was Rubber Glover, Rubber Glove, Rubber Glover. And I knew that wouldn't last long, and so your hope is that you just don't do anything too stupid to get a call sign uh, that, that reflects something you did poorly, even though most call signs are not flattering. And so I, I've always been pretty opinionated, and I talk a lot. And so my commanding officer in my call sign review got up and made a suggestion. He wrote up on the board, I-T-I-K-E. And he walked away, sat back down in his chair, and he says, I think I know everything. <laughs> and so it's all, it's, for me, it's a reminder that uh, it's OK sometimes to keep my opinions to myself. But they shortened it to Ike, I know everything. You know, Victor, we're, we're at a time where you know, as a country, we're somewhat divided. Uh, uh, do you get a different perspective looking down on this big blue marble from 260 miles up? Uh, d does it change your perspective at all? You know, Al, that is a great question because it, there are some aspects of it that that have changed, but then there are some things that it has just reinforced my faith and my hope have just been renewed and strengthened. Those were there and, and they continue to grow. Being up here, looking at the planet, it also makes me think about how fragile existence is. Being up here at about 250 miles up, it is clear to me that I am way above the atmosphere or at least the part of the atmosphere we could live in. And so it makes me appreciate how fragile that thing not only gives us life or sustains life, it protects us from things flying through space, little rocks that would want to hit the planet or maybe people are burned up in the atmosphere. So it also protects us in that way. And so I think about the planet more than I ever have. But it also makes me think about how fragile human life is and how important. I think that is something we all can get behind, all of us understand that human life is fragile and it deserves to be protected. And so I think some, some views have been reinforced uh, and some things have been changed. Looking at the earth without the lines drawn on typical maps and to just appreciate the beauty of, of nature. And, and, and it's pretty clear where man has been and where man continues to build and to expand, but, but there are some spaces out there where we haven't been and it is just absolutely phenomenal. And trying to manage that balance going forward is something that all of us are gonna be challenged to do. But we have to do it because it's about our existence. Uh, uh, for folks watching this, uh, what, what's your message? What, what, what thoughts do you have uh, that, that you want people watching this at home to know? Well, one, I want you to know that, that not just myself, but our entire crew, we are up here working hard for you. We want to make you proud, and, and we hope that we're doing the best work that we can for humanity, for all of humanity. You see those flags behind me? I wish we had just, actually we do. Right up there you see a globe. That might as well be the biggest flag up there right in the middle because we're working hard for, for all people. And, you know, my personal message, I try to focus on that next generation and kids making sure that they have the tools to dream big, but also to make and start on those plans to achieve them. I, I, I think that human life is important and we have to protect it. And I think our planet is precious and we have to protect it. And if you know those things, then, then I've probably said too much. <laughs> uh, anybody you want to say hi back to here on Earth? Well, you know, I, I, one of the best things about this, going through this experience, is how many people that I get to hear from and, and all of the thoughts and prayers and considerations that come with it, that has been truly the wind beneath my wings. And so from, from my school teachers, my AP biology teacher back in, in, in Ontario in Southern California, Robin Niketa, she's an amazing inspiration and mentor. My high school calculus teacher, Gerald Robinson. Uh, and I could go through a long list. My college professors, Jim Lacasio, my advisor, Dan Walsh. Uh, I've had so many folks that have contributed and invested in me. My college coaches, Coach Patterson, Coach Linus Cow, my wrestling coach, uh, mentors in the Navy, commanding officers, um, my former boss, John McCain. I just, there's so many. Uh, but you know what? I owe a, an immense debt of gratitude to my mother and my father. Uh, they are the, the, the primary influences in my life. They, they helped to get me to this point alive and sane, and I think that's saying something. 
And then the, the, the journey that we've been on, my family, my wife, Deanna, and my kids, Genesis, Maya, Joya, and Corinne, uh, have been with me on this adventure for 22 years. Uh, Deanna and, and my kids, as long as they've been alive. And so I just want to tell them that I love them and thank you for, for being along on this ride. And, and hopefully it just continues to go up from here. You know, I, and one last thing. I know it, it, there's the ISS 20th anniversary flag behind you. What is it like being part of that? You know, I've heard the idea floated that the International Space Station should win a Nobel Peace Prize. And I can't tell you that I support that idea more. It is such a powerful testament to what we are capable of when we, it's not about putting our differences aside. When we actually take those collective differences and we work together on something great that's in support of all people, this is just one of the things that we're capable of. And, and to be a small part of that team, I, I'm overwhelmed by that, Al. I, I still consider myself that 16-year-old kid at Ontario High School uh, struggling to graduate, and, uh, and, and now I'm on the International Space Station. America is amazing, and God is good. That's all I can say. It's a great thing to be a part of this, knowing that we've been doing this for 20 years. Well, Victor Glover, I, I, it, it is an honor and a thrill to speak with you 250 miles up there in space. Uh, I just want you to know how proud we are uh, of you and, and everything that you represent. The pleasure has truly been mine. It has been great talking with you, and I hope you have a great weekend, Al. It's great to see your face up here, too. You, too. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you to all participants from NBC News. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.